It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Change makers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. Exposure to environmental toxins, medications, and lifestyle factors like stress, excessive alcohol use, and unhealthy diets make sustaining gut balance increasingly important. Today's guest, Dr. William Davis, joins us to talk about how we can reprogram our microbiome to improve our health. Dr. Davis is a cardiologist and author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Wheat Belly. His new book is Super Gut, A Four-Week Plan to Reprogram Your Microbiome, Restore Health, and Lose Weight. Welcome, Dr. Davis. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Joan. Thanks for the uh, (laughs) re-invitation. Well, Doctor, I'm so happy that you accepted because I wanted to do a show about the importance of gut health during and after taking certain medications like antibiotics because I've been realizing more and more that most people who take medications have no idea of the impact those drugs have on the body. So, If we've learned anything in recent years, it's how important our gut health is. So let's start off by having a a basic conversation about what is gut health and and why is it so important? You know, for years, Joan, we dismissed the microbiome, that is the microbes dwelling in the human gastrointestinal tract. We dismissed it as nothing but a nuisance, (laughs) this thing that caused diarrhea after you took a course of antibiotics. Now it's become clear with more modern methods of analyzing the species, the uh, types of microbes living in the genetic tract, it has become clear they are absolutely crucial to overall health. And taking antibiotics is a huge, uh, like like dropping a bomb in a pond. You're going to kill all kinds of things, many of which won't recover. And so we've got to claw our way back to microbiome health. So, Doctor, the word bacteria tends to carry a negative connotation, but it's not all bad. Why is good bacteria so important? because they provide numerous important functions. They influence the dialogue in your head, whether it's a dialogue of hate and and anger or a dialogue of optimism and happiness. It determines numerous hormonal levels like testosterone, estrogen, oxytocin, and numerous others. And of course, it determines intestinal health, so a disruptive microbiome can be responsible for conditions like ulcerative colitis, or even conditions outside the gastrointestinal tract, like Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's dementia, depression, a big one, Joan, high blood pressure, obesity, type 2 diabetes. In other words, virtually all modern human diseases need to be reconsidered in light of either the contribution of or the start of by the microbiome. When a person is prescribed an antibiotic or certain other medications, and we know it's like a bomb going off and, it, and everything gets wiped out in the gut, what should we be doing to prevent the fallout or the problems that can arise? You know, if, if you must take an antibiotic, and let's face it, sometimes we have no choice. If you must take an antibiotic, the most important thing you can do is, of all kind of odd things, get the fungus, Saccharomyces boulardii. There is very good evidence that this fungus, which is not susceptible to that antibiotic because it's not a bacteria, it's a fungus. It's a cousin, Joan. It's a cousin of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. That's the common fungus used to make beer and wine. Well, this different strain called Saccharomyces boulardii, a cousin of that other yeast, is adapted to the human body. And if you get it in sufficient numbers, it protects a lot of the microbes from being killed by that antibiotic. It's not 100%, but it's the majority of microbes won't die due to that antibiotic. Now, here's a little twist for you, for your listeners. You can buy it as a commercial probiotic. It's called Flora Store in the U.S., other names in other countries. But here's the problem with a lot of probiotic preparations. Because it's very costly to make these things, they put few bacteria in the capsule. So one of the things that I do, especially during the course of antibiotics, is get that capsule, empty it into juice, 
any juice, apple juice, uh, grape juice, cranberry juice, preferably juices that have a lot of pulp in them, but it must not have any preservatives like potassium sorbate. And then just let it sit on the counter for 48 hours. Leave the cap on very lightly, not tightly. That's very important because within 24 hours, there's going to be so much carbon dioxide produced that if you cap it tightly, it will literally explode. So cap it lightly, and in 48 hours, you have huge counts of Saccharomyces boulardii, and you sip a quarter cup several times a day to limit your sugar. The process of fermentation does reduce the sugar by about half, but there is still is some sugar, so to minimize your exposure to sugar, small servings quarter, maybe half a cup, several times a day. That's the most important, most powerful thing you can do to preserve your microbiome during antibiotics. But you're doing that with one capsule? So one capsule in any volume of juice, uh, a quart, a gallon, doesn't matter. And then you make, once you make that after 48 hours of fermentation, you can make another batch from a little bit of that prior batch. So you buy the probiotic just once, and if you keep on going, you'll have this juice for as long as you want. What I don't understand, Dr. Davis, we know what happens in the gut when you take antibiotics or certain medication. When a doctor prescribes a prescription, why don't they give you another sheet of paper that says, while you're taking this, you need to do this? They should. Unfortunately, modern healthcare takes about 20 years on average to catch up to the science. So that's why doctors, even today, will say things like probiotics don't work. Uh, did you consult Dr. Google? All those kinds of things I'd like to say. When the truth of it is that the science has advanced dramatically and it's continuing to advance daily. It's that fast. It's changing so quickly. And there are huge insights into health. But unfortunately, you can't get that information from your doctor. That's why people have to listen to shows like yours to get the real cutting edge information. I should mention another strategy in the way of probiotics is lots of different species and strains have been looked at for restoring a healthy microbiome. So there are a handful that have been proven effective. The standout is Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG strain. Now, one of the things we have to do is pay attention to strain. Because some strains do it, some strains don't. In this case, it's Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG strain. That is by far the most important. You can take it during a course of antibiotics. You just want to separate them. In other words, if you take your antibiotic at 7 a.m., don't take the probiotic for at least several hours so you don't kill off all the microbes. And you have to continue this for at least several weeks after you finish your antibiotics. And I wanted to do this show because I am having experience personally right now with my son who has to take antibiotics. And when I contacted the pharmacist, I knew the answers to the questions that I was about to ask her. And I was really blown away by the answers she had given. I asked that specific question, if you're taking a probiotic with an antibiotic, how do you space it out? And her response was, oh, it doesn't matter. You can take it whenever. So that really made me nervous because I I think I know a little bit more than the average person, but I really felt badly for people who don't know anything about this with the information they're being given. Sadly, Joan, it's true of pharmacists. It's true of doctors. It's true of nearly everyone in healthcare. There, there, thankfully, there are people in functional medicine, uh, 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 alternative care, they, they are keeping abreast of the science. But it is challenging because it is coming out at us at such breakneck speed that you have to make it a point to keep up with the science of the microbiome. But the good thing about this, Joan, is that the wisdom is growing very rapidly. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that in just a few years, when we have a condition like obesity or type 2 diabetes or migraine headaches, the first thing we're going to do is address the microbiome. If someone were to take a probiotic, you mentioned a, a good one. It, should they be taking one that is multiple strains, and should it have a minimum of 10 billion? You make a good point. So no one's worked out what the perfect probiotic looks like. The closest I know are two, and I have no relationship with these companies. There's one called Equilibrium that's made from human uh, microbes, over 100 different species and strain. There's another product called Sugar Shift that, uh, in, in preliminary experience, reduces blood sugar, but that's far more than that because the microbiologist, Dr. Raul Kennel, who's a friend of mine, formulated this collection of microbes because they collaborate. And when microbes collaborate, they have far bigger effects. In this case, reduction of blood sugar and other benefits. Most other commercial probiotics are kind of haphazard collections of this species and that species. In coming years, we will have much more effective probiotics, 
But so to, to kind of amplify the benefits of getting a probiotic, one of the best things people can do is to get fermented foods. Beyond the Saccharomyces boulardii fermented juices, you can ferment all kinds of things, vegetables, yogurts, kefirs, vegetables on your kitchen counter, uh, sauerkraut, provided it's fermented, kimchi, and numerous other fermented foods that provide important microbes to your GI tract. And that really helps. Now, were those known as prebiotics? So prebiotics are things that microbes consume or metabolize. So these are things like the fibers in onions and garlic or legumes. So the FOS inulin is the prebiotic fiber in, say, an onion. It's the galacto-oligosaccharide prebiotic fiber in legumes, like black beans and chickpeas. And so these are the things that microbes consume, the polysaccharides and mushrooms. These are things that nourish microbes. But when you nourish microbes, they do wonderful things for you. They produce metabolites, like butyrate, that heal and nourish the intestinal bacteria. So we've been talking about antibiotics and what it does to the gut. Are there other medications that are commonly taken that can do a similar type damage? Tons. Not quite as severe as antibiotics, but common drugs, Joan, stomach acid blocking drugs, the uh, H2 blockers like ranitidine and dimetidine, the PPIs like um, uh, uh, protonics and uh, acefex disrupt the microbiome, anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen and naproxen, uh, uh, statin cholesterol drugs, birth control pills, on and on and on. Unfortunately, a lot of drugs we don't know if they have a microbiome uh, consequence because it's not part of the FDA application to investigate the impact in the microbiome. I suspect in coming years and decades that will become a requirement because it's so important. But right now, there's not a requirement. So we often don't know about other drugs, but there's a long list that we know impact the microbiome. Is there a contraindication to taking a probiotic with any of these drugs? The only contraindication is somebody who is severely immunocompromised, someone who's currently on cancer chemotherapy or has um, a real low white count. These are fairly obvious situations. But everyday people going to work, going to school, uh, don't have to worry about consequences of probiotics. So, Doctor, what else do you want us to know about maintaining a healthy gut? Joan, how important it is to get these fermented foods. You know, we forgot because when home refrigeration became a thing in 1927, 1928, with Frigidaire's uh, discovery of Freon as a refrigerant, we all forgot that these fermented foods that we thought were, you know, not, that were essential for human health, we started seeing as rotten, but they're actually healthier for you, and they're delicious also. So adding back fermented foods, learning how, and you can do this, you can go online and see tons and tons of information on how to ferment vegetables, for instance. It's always been my books, all my books, like Super Gut. It's very easy, it's virtually no cost, and it's one of the most healthy practices you can engage in. Doctor, if we don't follow your advice and take a probiotic or eat fermented foods when doing a course of medication or taking a different medication, when the person is done, will the gut eventually heal by itself? Typically not, sadly, Joan, because if you lose, let's say you lose 50 species from that drug, you can't grow them back. In other words, if you have a garden... The only way you get tomatoes is to plant tomatoes. You can't get tomatoes just by looking at it, right? It doesn't generate out of the air. And so you have to purposely rebuild your microbiome. Unfortunately, it's gotten to a kind of a, a really bad tipping point in modern people because from generation to generation, there's been a deterioration in the microbiome. So your grandparents passed on a flawed or devastated microbiome to, their, to your parents, who then in turn passed on to you. And with each generation, each passing generation, there's deterioration of the composition and loss of microbial species. But the great thing is, wonderful things can happen when you identify some of those species and restore them. So you and I have talked about how we restore, for instance, my favorite microbe in the world, Lactobacillus rotari, that nearly everybody has lost. But when you restore it, there's a surge in oxytocin levels, and you experience empathy for other people. You understand other people's points of view. Ladies love it because it smooths their skin wrinkles. Guys love it because it restores youthful muscle and strength. I love it because it gives me deep sleep for a chronic insomniac, accelerated healing, and all kinds of other. That's just one micro chunk. You know, as, as you're talking, I'm thinking about our children. Every time they go to the pediatrician for any type of a cold or ear infection or whatever it is, they're automatically prescribed an antibiotic. What are we doing to these kids? If these, if these bacteria are gone and they don't come back on their own, 
how, how are we damaging our children? Oh, there's no question we are damaging children. One great example, <laughs> not, I shouldn't say great, but terrible example, is the loss of a species called Bifidobacteria infantis. So infants who don't have this don't grow properly. They don't have normal neurological maturation. They're more prone to asthma, type 1 diabetes, and other autoimmune conditions. They are more likely to become obese as older kids, type 2 diabetes, and they have a lower IQ. So you can reverse this. So a mother can reverse this by supplying bifidobacter infantis to the child because the first year of life is very unique. But I said about your infantis comprises 80 to 90 percent of the entire microbiome in a child, in a baby. So not having it is a major deficit for that child's development. So for an example of how destructive things have gotten, but how much power you have when you understand some of these basic issues and take action. You know how difficult kids are with what you can get them to eat or, or take. Is there a product or is there some way that you can recommend getting this into a child in a way that he or she will accept it? So the way it's done, and the people at University of California, Davis, have done some very elegant work to validate all this. But it's commercial, commercialized as a product called Evivo, E-V-I-V-O. And it's supplied as a powder that a nursing mother can mix with breast milk and then feed her child. Now, I've, I've suggested to my audience that let's go one step even better. What if mom, during pregnancy, before delivery, makes a yogurt or other fermented food with that microbe, consumes the yogurt or other food, and then she populates her vagina and her breast, breast milk, with this microbe and passes the microbe onto the child at birth and during breastfeeding the way it was supposed to. You can still continue to feed it through breast milk, but at least you've given the baby this microbe in the context of the mother's broader microbiome. And I've been seeing wonderful results with this. Dr. Davis's book is Super Gut, a four-week plan to reprogram your microbiome, restore health, and lose weight. If you'd like to learn more about Dr. Davis and his work, you can visit drdavisinfinitehealth.com. That's D-R, drdavisinfinitehealth.com. Doctor, I want to thank you so much for accepting this invitation at the last minute, and thank you for being such a light and for being passionate about helping all of us. Oh, thank you, Joan. I'm always happy to come back on your show. Thank you for joining us. I hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that the information provided is the opinion of our guest and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on our site, listen to past shows on demand, read the digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, and be sure to follow the show on social media. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.